are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening. Welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Thank you for tuning in this evening. My name is Andrea Judici and I am the host and also tonight the guest again. I had so much fun being a guest on my own show that I decided to do it again. I have with me my guide dog who as always I'm not introducing because that's how it's best for us to stay focused and for us to stay safe as a team for people not to be able to use his name. When I was a guest on my show in January, we talked about some of the myths that exist about blindness and blind people. And the show went by so quickly that I didn't get to talk about all the things that I wanted to. And since I'm really good friends with the producer, that's me, I got to come on again. So here I am to tell you some more things that you might or might not know about blind people. One of them that I find so interesting is that blind people are assumed to automatically be friendly and nice. I remember very distinctly many, many years ago on a show called Northern Exposure, there was a guest, you know, one time appearance by someone who was a, a character who was blind. I don't know if the actor was, but, and the next day at work, everyone was grumpy about it because the man, the blind person was a grump. He was just a curmudgeonly old man. And I said, well, I mean, why? Just because he was blind, he shouldn't be grumpy. And it does seem that people really think, well, Blind people are so nice. Well, some of us are nice and some of us are mean and some are nasty and unfriendly and some are funny and some aren't. And just like in the population of sighted people, there are blind people that have all sorts of um, personality types. And I even for, I, th I think of myself as sort of an outgoing, friendly type of person, but in the right circumstances, if I'm um, tired or if I'm in a situation where I'm feeling afraid, um, if someone is distracting my guide dog as we're crossing a large intersection, I assure you that I will be neither friendly nor nice because I'm scared. Because if I'm in the middle of a street crossing and someone's distracting my dog, I could die. So all of my friendliness goes right out the window and I'm, I'm scared and so I get sort of short-tempered and angry. So I think that's an important thing to remember is that blind people, as I keep saying, are people and we have all sorts of personalities. Something I hear from people all the time is, pe is that is, they ask me how many steps it takes me to get from, you know, say, um, my desk at work to the coffee pot. And the reality is I don't count steps. I know that lots of blind people do, and that's fabulous for them. I get so distracted by trying to count my steps, I forget exactly what I'm doing and where I'm going. That was not a technique that I was taught in my orientation and mobility training. I don't know if it's not currently popular or just not something I did. But anyway, it didn't happen for me, so I don't do it. And I know lots of blind people that don't do it. Um, I, I do like to um, talk about how blind people don't all read Braille. And we've talked about that on other shows, but that Braille is, well, very important for literacy for people who are Braille readers. Many blind people, because blindness is not just everybody being in the dark, but they're all levels of uh, visual of, remaining vision even within the, the classification of legal blindness from quite a bit of usable vision under the right circumstances to total blindness in a very small portion. I think maybe less than 5% of the blind population is totally blind. So there are a lot of people who don't read Braille because it's just not practicable. Um, they can read magnified print and that makes more sense for them. One thing that is endlessly frustrating to me. It happens, anybody who spent time with me, if you're my friend, my family, my, anybody who spent any time 
with me certainly knows that this happens. There's a, an assumption that I cannot speak for myself. So if we're sitting at a table and it's time to take the order, the server will say to my companions, what does she want for dinner? And if we're in the grocery store and we're paying for, so I'm paying for something, the person behind the counter will hand the change to the person with me. Um, and it's, I think it's, it, again, none of this is done out of malicious intent. It's done because of the, perhaps the inability to make eye contact, not sure exactly how to initiate. The person probably doesn't know my name and they probably feel uncomfortable saying, yo, blind lady, what do you want for dinner? Um, so what happens is that this, this happens and someone gets asked a question on my behalf. And then the person who's being asked may feel a little uncomfortable. They don't really want to answer for me, but they're not sure what to do. So I, ha I have some friends that um, handle it in different ways. I have friends who will say, I don't know, ask her. Or they'll just simply, if, if the person is making eye contact with them, the person with me, my friend, will just completely turn their back so that they've, they've, they've erased the possibility for the server or the clerk or whoever it is to make eye contact with them, therefore sort of forcing them to deal with me. So, but that's a really common thing that myself and my friends who are blind and, and everyone I know who's blind deals with is that it's very common for whoever is addressing the blind person to really address the sighted person with them. And um, it's completely unnecessary. I'm certainly know what I want for dinner and I'm capable of taking my change. And I've had it happen at medical offices um, where the doctor or the nurse or the medical professional won't talk to me. They're only talking to the person who's with me if I happen to have someone with me. Um, and that can be very frustrating. So it's something to, to just to think about. Um, and uh, so that is, is important. Now, this is a funny one. This is a whole series of things about music. Now, we all know, of course, that all blind people play piano. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. I swear, I was asked uh, and have been asked many times, actually, when doing presentations, when did you start your piano lessons? Um, I don't play. I, the world is a better place because I don't ever touch a piano. <laughs> I'm not musically inclined at all. Um, but there's an assumption because there are some very famous blind people who do play piano that somehow we all do that. And another one I love is that because I'm blind, I must really love all blind musicians. That must be the music I'm listening to. So I'm listening to Stevie Wonder and Jeff Healy and Andre Bocelli and Jose Feliciano and Ronnie Millsap and even George Shearing. And I rarely listen to any of those people exclusively. I have listened to all of them, not because they're blind, but because Jose sings a cool Christmas song and you know all, all those other things. Um, but I just think it's so interesting. It's like, oh, you must love, you know, so-and-so. And it's like, well, well, why? Because just, just because they're blind. I, I happen to love many of these people's music because I think it's beautiful or interesting or creative or meaningful in the words, but not just because they're blind. There are certainly plenty of musicians I listen to who aren't blind. Um, and I assume that all of you sighted people out there do actually also listen to some of these blind musicians, even though they are blind. So that is an interesting um, thing that happens to me quite a bit when people ask me about, about the music. Um, and by the way, not all blind people wear sunglasses. This is another thing that I think happens because sometimes a person wears sunglasses when they're blind because they might have um, extreme light sensitivity in their eyes. They might have um, some sort of deformity to their eyes and people, it seems that the rest of the world gets quite uncomfortable if there's an, a very unusual look to someone's eye. And so I think that doctors or family or somebody says, hey, you know, maybe you should wear some sunglasses. So you got to get some really cool shades and rock those. But many, many, many people who are blind don't wear sunglasses. And it's kind of like you lose your street cred if you're not wearing sunglasses. So I, wanna, I just want to assure you that you can actually be a really hip blind person and not wear sunglasses. So I've been told anyway. Um, I want to turn also to some more serious things that I didn't get as much of a chance to touch on uh, in my last presentation. And I really, or when I was on the show last as a guest and a producer, and I really want to touch on them because they're very, very important. And I want to frame this by saying that just recently I was at a convention in, in Florida and it was 
very wonderful. It was a guide dog using user convention. And one of the speakers there was not um, speaking specifically as a blind person and a guide dog user. They were a sighted person who'd come in to do a presentation. And they started their presentation by saying, and again, I'm in no way am I being critical, but it just was so interesting to have just done the show and then have go to that conference and sort of have it all sort of come full circle. She said that when she, most of her life, she'd never known any blind people. And then she retired from her, whatever her job had been, and she started to volunteer, and she started to volunteer with some blind people. And she said, and I realized that I had always thought that blind people couldn't do anything. And then after volunteering with blind people, I realized they could, and I thought, my gosh, here's an educated person. You'd assume that they, this person had been a pastor, so you'd assume they would have a fairly wide range of experiences and sort of open-mindedness. And yet she admittedly didn't understand that blind people did things and had a life. And so I thought that's so timely that this, I would have heard this person say that out loud after having this sort of topic brought up um, on my show. But one of the things that I really want to make sure people understand is that being blind is not a tragedy. It's difficult, it's frustrating, it's sad, it's irritating, it's limiting on some levels, like the fact that Braille isn't always available or I can't drive my own car. And I don't want to say it's as simple as an um, inconvenience, but to think of it as a tragedy frames me as a blind person in the life that I live in a very diminishing sort of a way. Um, and, if, and if a person goes along and thinks about a blind person as being a tragedy, having a tragic life, then they make the assumption that the life that person's living is diminished, um, is subpar to a sighted person's. And I, and I just want to assure you that, that that's not true. Um, certainly if someone loses their vision, certainly someone who's had no vision their whole life. I have days when I hate being blind, when I just wake up in the morning and I'm not like, oh boy, I'm blind, yay for me. And I wanna just, I wanna just go back to bed and say, this is too much, it's too hard to do all these things. I don't wanna deal with it today. I don't wanna have to wait for the transportation and you know, I don't wanna have to walk home with 35 pounds of stuff on my back because that's where the, how much my groceries weighed. But then I assume if I were a sighted person, there'd also be days when I didn't wanna get up and drive through the traffic or have to lug my grocery bags to my car. So I, I think that's a really important thing to remember is that while I can have a down day and it may be specific to my blindness, again, it's not a tragedy. I, I have a friend who's, who told me when I was asking her her thoughts on being a blind person in myths, she said that she knew someone who had very sincerely um, gone to her and said that this, this person felt that she could really relate to my friend and her blindness because this person had a diagnosis of terminal cancer. And my friend, I give her credit for being able to say this and, and be polite and yet have the courage to say it, said, I'm really, really sorry about what's going on with you and that's horrible and terrible that you must be facing that. But please recognize that my blindness is not like a terminal illness. My blindness is something that's just a part of me and it certainly can be a pain in the ass and it can certainly be difficult but I, I need to assure you that it's not anything like having a terminal diagnosis. And so I just, like I said, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it's really important. Um, something that happens, and it happens with, it can happen with uh, parents, teachers, family, friends, professors, uh, bosses, medical professionals, everybody. It's the treating the blind person as if simply having academic, professional, social accomplishments is amazing simply because they're blind. Oh my gosh, you're amazing because you're blind and you have a job. You're amazing because you're blind and you leave the house. It's not that you can't find an individual person to be an inspiration to you regardless of their disability or not disability or what they do, but to assign exceptional status simply because of a disability is very harmful to the person with a disability because it means you don't have to do anything but breathe and be considered to be all that in a bag of chips. And that's not good for any of us to be put onto that kind of unrealistic pedestal. It can, you, I, I've seen it so often in children who were born blind 
and, and instead of setting realistic expectations, their parents basically, oh my gosh, you're wonderful. You came down to the table for breakfast. I'm so proud of you. Oh, come on, seriously, blind children do all sorts of things. As a, as a person who grew up as a blind child with thankfully a parent who had tremendously realistic and wonderful expectations, I knew that my role in the house was as a member of the family. I had responsibilities, I had jobs, I had chores, I had things I had to do and expectations for what those would be. That's healthy. If a blind child is never given any expectations, they have no reason to want to strive to do anything and no expectation and no real understanding that they should achieve something because they're being told just by existing, they're fabulous and amazing and inspirational. So that's really, really important for people to hear who are parents, teachers. I had a doctor once that was gonna let me off the hook for something that I wasn't doing and it was had nothing to do with blindness, but that doctor was willing to say, oh, well, because you're blind, I'm gonna give you a pass. And I was like, actually, no, I don't, I don't deserve a pass just because I'm blind for this particular thing. I, I, you know, um, So that is just, it's critical. And if you meet a blind, child who's been raised without expectations, they're timid, the world is overwhelming, and they don't have the ambition that every child should have to grow up and become their own person, to live independently. And that's another thing that I find is that a lot of people, sighted people, who've never met a blind person, uh, don't know anyone, again, can't picture how they would perform the tasks that they have to do in their house. So they don't believe that a blind person can live independently that there's a complete dependence on the sighted people in their world um, for cooking, cleaning, shopping, um, d- activities of daily living, like getting dressed and, and, and caring for your clothes, doing your wash. Now I'll admit that finding stains on clothes is very difficult. So I do, I do have people that I go to and say, before I wash and dry this piece of clothing and stick this stain in permanently, are there stains on, these, on, on this clothing? Um, Certainly that's something that I can't do on my own. But as far as doing the actual wash, cooking and cleaning and taking care of my house, I can certainly do all of that on my own. I've heard it said many times, oh my gosh, blind people, how do they have children? How do they raise babies? How do they raise, keep track of their kids? And well, I admit not having ever been the parent of a child, a human child, um, I have, I can't even imagine how any parent keeps track of any child for any period of time. They move so fast, but I can tell you that I have many, many friends who are either one or two blind parent families that are raising both blind or sighted children and are doing it magnificently. So that's, that's so important to remember that blind people can raise children. They can climb mountains. They can live typical lives like the rest of the people on the block. They can be lawyers and doctors. Um, it's just, it's just so, it's just so important. Um, and I, I want to tell you again and again and again, until you hear it forever, that, that blind people really aren't that different from sighted people. I want, I was visiting my cousin recently and she was, and she was telling me a story about a person that she knows and she happened to mention in conversation to this person that my visa wasn't going to be that long because I had to come back because I had to go, go back and get back to work. And this person said to her, work? What can she do? Now, this person has actually met me. What can she do? And my cousin kind of went, uh, really? And then she sort of tried to explain without being critical about the fact that, you know, with technology and all sorts, there's all sorts of things I can do and, and choose to do. But that's even someone who's met me, who knew that I had gotten from my home, managed to get on a plane on my own, get to Florida to visit on my own, but still couldn't picture me actually having a job. And I go back to reminding people that if that person who has encountered me out of my home environment, knowing that I got there on my own, can't picture me having a job, how will the hiring manager uh, at the interview, or how will the person at the job fair who's collecting resumes, how will that person picture the blind person getting to work? So those are, those are just really important things to to keep, to keep remembering. Um, it's, 
I, I, I feel like I'm being more serious and not as funny today, and that's okay. I, I, I can learn how to be serious if I really have to. Um, but I, I do think that along with the funny things like all blind people wear sunglasses and all blind people play the piano, there's also these, these underlying beliefs that if those don't change, the, that the equality in employment, the equality in acceptance is not going to happen. 75% of the blind population is under or unemployed. And I, I've heard people say this, that they think, well, blind people don't like to work. They just want to get everything for free. They, they just like, you know, that's what they do. And, that, and that's absolutely ludicrous. Just like in the sighted world, there are certainly people who take advantage of any system they can. Um, and there are blind people who will do that too. But there are lots and lots and lots and lots of blind people who want to have jobs, but because of transportation limitations primarily, or a lack of understanding of, of how a given job can be done, aren't getting the opportunity to work. And so that's these underlying perspectives and beliefs, even if they're not consciously held, are what's a huge part of what's keeping that problem prevalent. And so I think it's important that we, that I talk about it, even though it's not as funny and it's not as comfortable perhaps, I think it's important. I really know, I know, I don't just think, I know it's important um, for that to be said. One thing that I also really want to highlight is that blindness does not only affect the person who is blind. None of us are an island. We're all very interdependent. We have friends, family, coworkers, acquaintances, neighbors, clerks, you know, people who own local businesses. And those people are all part of our world. But particularly for family and friends, blindness is certainly experienced by those people too. And it's experienced in a lot of different ways. If, if you're a, a parent with a child who's born blind, you have to figure out how to parent that child because there will be things that are different, different styles of parenting, different approaches to things. And that's all something you have to figure out. And you may or may not have support to do that. If you are a person who's losing your vision uh, from a, some, some sort of age-related condition, now you've got your adult children, your grandchildren, your friends, your spouse, if you have one, your partner, who are having to deal with that loss as well. It's not the same, but it doesn't mean that it's less. They're going to mourn the fact that your life is changing. They're going to be frustrated by the things that frustrate you on your behalf and just because it's happening to someone they care about. And it's important for people to keep communication open to say, hey, you know, I really, I really hate that this is happening to you. Um, not that it's anyone, not that it's your fault. I remember coming home from school when I was little and I'd been being bullied and I couldn't figure out why people didn't like me. And I would say, I don't understand mommy. Why do people hate me? Cause I'm blind. And she'd say, I don't know. It's, it's terrible. And I wish I could make it different, but I can't. So we'll talk about it and then we'll go on because we can't make it different, but we can talk about it. We can acknowledge that it's happening. And that's so critical to be able to talk about feelings and acknowledge them is, is, is tremendously freeing and important. I know that growing up, I was allowed to say those things. I was allowed to say every now and then, I am so frustrated because my book isn't available in print, in braille. <laughs> it's only available in print. I am so frustrated because of this or that. It's not that I can't do it or that I think that my life is horrible because I'm blind, but my God, this is frustrating. And it was okay to say that and then to find a solution and go on. I have many friends who have disabilities who were not ever allowed to say that as a child. They were never allowed to say, I wish things were easier or I wish people didn't care about this or I'm frustrated by my disability. As adults, they were dealing with the kind of anger and frustration they were never allowed to experience as children. And that's really hard. That's very disruptive to the parent-child relationship. It's very disruptive to their own sort of peace of mind. So communication is really important. And remembering that even if you're a person who's dealing with blindness, vision loss, or blindness since birth, the people around you are also dealing with it and they're entitled to their feelings. 
that's perfectly okay for them to have their feelings. Um, and it's important for them to be allowed to have their feelings. I've talked to a lot of people who don't want to go on a trip. Um, maybe we're going on a day trip or maybe we're thinking about some sort of, you know, overnight week visit somewhere. And, and they think, oh, God, there's so many logistics to traveling. There's your dog and the dog's food and you won't know where you are. And, and, they, and they get overwhelmed by that. I've had a lot. It doesn't thankfully happen in my family. I, I so lucked out in the friends and family department. But I've talked to a lot of my friends who just get so frustrated because their family is very reluctant to embrace the idea of vacationing with them. And that's hurtful and it's lonely and it's not necessary. Yes, it's going to, uh, yes, a blind person is not going to know their way around an, un, an unfamiliar hotel and it might take a little bit longer than the sighted person, although I'm not convinced of that. Um, and you might be a little more dependent on using sighted guide in an unfamiliar environment than you would be in your own neighborhood. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's too much trouble. It just means you have to go up at it a little bit of a different way. And I think that it would be, I would, I would, I would encourage people to think and frame their thinking that way so that family can feel less blind, blind people can feel less sort of, uh, abandoned or, um, sort of isolated from family events. Well, there's this party on Sunday, but then we'd have to come and get you and then drive over there because there's no public transportation, then bring you back and then go home. And that's really a pain. And some days it will be. I absolutely want to say that it's always important to check if what you're asking makes sense in the, in the grand scheme of things. But I, I just, I feel, I feel very frustrated on behalf of my friends who deal with that because I was, I am so lucky. My family never, ever, ever makes me feel that way. It, and I never feel like if there's extra driving involved, it's a burden. Or if, you know, it takes a little more time because of whatever, that that's a, a problem. And I just am so, so grateful for so many things about my family. Um, and, and it's really just the absolute acceptance. I was talking to my cousin on this last vacation and we were talking about how she never felt like it was different with me the way I was treated from the other grandchildren. So right from the very start, that was the, that was the tone my mother set and said, this is what we're going to do. And that's how we did it. And that's really important. One thing that is, I want all of you to remember is that I've heard it so many times. Well, blindness is never going to happen to me. So I don't really have to worry about all this stuff. Well, I, that may or may not be true. I hope that we all get to stay as we are. And that would be wonderful, but know that if blindness does happen, you can live a wonderfully full life. I'm here to tell you that it's, that it can be really fun and you can, um, you know, have live independently and have a job and have hobbies. You can have friends, you can do your own thing. You can be interpersonal. You can watch movies. You can use blindness work. You can use sighted words like see and hear and look. You don't have to wear sunglasses. You don't have to play the piano. You don't have to like music by blind people and you are going to be okay. I know that this show wasn't nearly as funny. I didn't laugh as much, so I suspect perhaps the audience didn't either. But as I was watching last month's show and, and seeing the things that I talked about and remembering the things that I touched on, I knew that I hadn't gotten to everything. And so I really appreciate your giving me the opportunity to come again and talk about something that's so important to me. And since it's my show, I guess I can do that. You are tuned into A Blind Woman's View, as I see it, A Blind Woman's View. And this is, my name is Andrea Judici. If you have any questions, you can email me at a blindwomansview at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I think I will actually have another guest here, not just myself next month. Thanks so much. Have a great night. <laughs>